just so I can make sure it looks good here. Now let me share my screen. Share it there. Make sure this is working. Okay. Do you still get the credits if you watch it live? Like yeah, yeah so I'm going to give um I am going to give some instructions on that. I want to make sure this is working. Hold on. It looks like There we go. Looks like we're live. Good. It's working. That looks pretty good. Okay. So I'll get started. Welcome everybody. Thank you Brandon for the introduction. I am excited to be uh teaching tonight. It's been a while since I've done that. I'm going to Pass this out because we're going to be going over this today. Um, so I'll just, just take one, pass it on. If you have a pen or a pencil, you might like to have that too, and you can track along because we're going to be going over uh, the Moliere diagram. Okay. Well, let me go to, you don't need to see that screen. You guys need to see this screen. Okay. The Moliere diagram. So if you're not familiar with that, the Moliere diagram is a really important um, diagram to help understand thermodynamics. So when I was like a college student, um, we did a lot of this. I know this is not a college class. That's not the point to be intimidating. I know you see a lot of lines, a lot of numbers. You could look at that and be like, wow, that's, that's intimidating, but don't, um, don't be intimidated. Hey, for anyone joining via the live stream on YouTube, I got to make this announcement. If you want to, um, obtain credit for being here and getting your uh, certificate emailed to you, what you need to do is. I can see that you're here because it has a list, like there's nine people on right now, but you need to leave your name, like type it into the comment section or into the chat, the live chat, because if your little tag name isn't clear who you are, we won't know who to send it to. So uh, type in your name if you want a certificate in that in the live chat, and then we will be monitoring that, and that's how you'll get uh, a um, uh, certificate, and that'll get emailed to you by by Brandon or someone at the board. And I think Jesse will do that. Who does that, Brandon? Jesse. Jesse, I think, will send that, okay? All right, back to Moliere diagram. So um, this man right here, Professor Moliere, was a German scientist in the, uh, shoot, I forget the years. I think it was, uh, ah, who cares, 18, 1900s, long time ago. But he is the one who kind of, who kind of developed this chart. Now, of course, he didn't develop the chart. It's like he invented it. This is science. These are like uh, tests were done. And these, this right here is just facts. But he's the one that put it down into, into this chart that we're going to study today. Now, um, sometimes this diagram is called the Moliere diagram. The Rita book calls it that a lot after him. Um, actually, when I was in college, like we didn't call it that. We just called them pH diagrams. And that's because pressure is on the vertical axis and enthalpy which usually has the letter H is on the horizontal. So they're sometimes just called pH diagrams. So I'll use those terms synonymously. If I can say Moliere diagram or enthalpy or a pH diagram, same difference. Okay. Um, so what is it? Well, really it's, it is the saturation tables that you're familiar with. Like pull out the back of your Rita card. That's a real simple part of the saturation table. It's the pressure temperature relationship, but it's the larger saturation tables, maybe that you get out of something like ASHRAE fundamentals and it's put into a visual chart. That's all it is. So this is tabular form. And actually, if you had ASHRAE fundamentals book, I got one in my office and you open up, they have the, the saturation tables and the Moliere chart for each refrigerant. There's like tons of different refrigerants. They have them side by side on each one is, is two pages. So it's the same, it's the same thing. So nothing to be intimidated about. So let's just break this down like line by line, item by item and how it could benefit you as a refrigeration professional or someone as, that's a stakeholder in the refrigeration industry. All right, first of all, I already said this, um, but on the vertical axis, we have pressure. Notice the units, anyone, what are the units? Okay. Another announcement to the live stream folks on the live chat. Don't only leave your name because that will make you a certificate. But if you want it, you got to also leave your email address. Otherwise we'll just make you a certificate, but you'll never get it. So name and email address or however you want it to get to you. Okay. All right. So what are the units? PSIA. What does the A mean? Absolute. When we're in normal everyday language, you're with a client, you're at a site, and you're talking pressure, what units do you use? Gauge pressure, because that's what gauges read. Everyday folks, when we're just working, we talk gauge pressure. That's what we're used to. 
What is absolute pressure? Well, it's gauge plus 14.7 if you're at sea level. It's taking into account also that there is a pressure on our atmosphere that is like shared. And so, but in terms of like engineering calculations, you do have to use absolutes. It's just important to know that because um, if you're like charting a system, like if you try to mimic what I'm about to do, but you do it off gauge pressure and you put an absolute, it'll all, your results will be all fouled up. Okay. So you got to have 14.7, pretty easy to do. Okay. Um, another thing that really important to note is notice here, that's the difference between uh, one PSIA and 10. And now from 10 to 100, same distance. So what does that mean? This is a logarithmic scale. This is not a linear scale where every every spatial increment has the same value. It's incre every equally spaced increment is 10 times bigger than the previous one. That's what a log scale is. That's also important to know. So we go from one to 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000 equally spaced. We call it a log scale. It's something that's increasing really fast, all right? Um, all right, on the horizontal end, Access, we have enthalpy. Enthalpy is like this intimidating word. I'm not going to get into enthalpy except to say, think of it just like energy. It's a little more complicated than that, but you could think of it like energy content. And this is specific enthalpy in that it's BTUs. That's a unit of heat per pound. So per unit mass. So this is actually, we call specific enthalpy, meaning um, not absolute enthalpy. These numbers are actually arbitrary. What do I mean by arbitrary? It means zero was selected as an arbitrary value. So it's only useful in measuring changes in enthalpy. Like when you go from 200 to 300, that's 100. It wouldn't matter if that was zero and 100, you would get the same difference. Okay. So that is confusing. Don't, don't worry too much about that. But notice, is this a logarithmic scale? No, this one's not. This is a, just a linear scale. Like every spatially, everything's equal. So we got our major axis is covered, right? You guys comfortable with that? So we could plot a point if we needed to. Now there's tons of other lines, but before we get into those, let's. Um, we also have this dome going on in the middle. What is that? Well, that's our saturation dome. We call it. Okay, in any point where we land inside this dome, we are saturated. So, like the tables in Rita Book One, Chapter Four. Right, that you use, that you use when you took the Caro exam, and they're in the they're in the supplemental guide for the Caro um, study packet. Those saturation tables is the values inside of here. Okay, and anything on this red line, which is the 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 outside uh, edge on the right side, would be a saturated vapor. Anything on this left side of the dome, which I've made a blue line, is a saturated liquid. So what is if that's a saturated liquid and that's a saturated vapor, what is it in between? What would you guys say? The mixture of there you go. Mixture. You nailed it. Mixture of saturated liquid and vapor. Exactly. So you are in the process of boiling, right? It's saturated. Where does saturation occur in a refrigeration system? Okay. Where more specific, what components? In condensers and evaporators. For sure, we have it in those components. You can have it other places. The receiver is typically saturated, right? Um, but for sure, anytime you're changing state from liquid to vapor or from vapor to liquid, you're going to have saturation and you'll be somewhere in this dome or on the edge of it. All right. This point right on top, we have a fancy name for that, which we call the critical point. Hey, Luz. <laughs> um, we call the critical point. We were talking and some of us were talking about, uh, you know, the U.S. cold had, folks have some transcritical CO2 system. What does transcritical mean? Well, that means you're actually operating above that point. So you're above the saturation dome where you don't ever uh, transition from liquid to vapor. You go straight from superheated vapor to, or uh, superheated vapor to uh, subcooled liquid. And we call that transcritical whenever you're up above that dome. But for the sake of today, we're looking at ammonia, uh, pH diagrams, Molière diagrams will never be transcritical. So we'll just forget that now. But when you hear transcritical CO2, that's what's happening. You're above that point above the dome. That is transcritical, okay? Um, anything in that blue shaded region is a subcooled liquid. Where do we get subcooling? Okay, at the outlet of the pump could be subcooled. If you have a subcooler installed, certainly then you see subcooling. Maybe the outlet of a condenser, right? If the condenser is oversized or the loads are such, you have the outlet of the condenser. Those would be typical spots. So if we said this is saturated, that's subcooled, what do you guys think this is going to be? 
Superheated, yeah. Where are we superheated? Where are we always superheated? Outlet, yeah, outlet of the compressor. Um, we can also be superheated, but not always at the outlet of the evaporator, so or the inlet to the compressor, right? It's like a DX system. Uh, we'll look at some of those those examples. Okay, and then I already mentioned inside where it's gray, that's saturated. Okay, so we good so far? We got the basics. So we're just describing what we probably already know. Now we've got this purple line. I've picked one of them. You can look at your chart down there, but you got these lines. This is 0.7. That's 0 0.8, 0 0.9. There are these lines that go up and to the right along our dome. These are, this is called uh, lines of constant quality. And what is quality? Quality is basically a, the percentage of, of our pound of ammonia that is vapor inside the saturation dome. So I highlighted this 0.7 line. That would mean that anywhere along that line, you're 70% saturated vapor, 30% saturated liquid. Because inside that dome, you're a mixture. Okay? See, that's where this would be like equivalent to one, basically, the outside. Okay? All right. Let's just practice um, using this. All right? I've marked a point there at, uh, let's say we have a suction temperature of 20. And feel free to follow along. If you have a pen or pencil, you can mark your page just, just like this. But let's say we have a 20 degree um, saturated liquid. All right. I've marked that point right there. It's saturated liquid. I'm on the saturated liquid line and we're on this temperature line that is 20 degrees. I know I haven't gone over the temperature lines yet. We will in a second though, but all these ones horizontally going across that are, that are flat are constant temperature, which is, um, consistent with what we know about boiling, right? When something changes state, the temperature doesn't change. Um, right. That's like read a book one stuff. Okay. And then let's say we add, so we're at, at that point, we're at on our uh, enthalpy, we're at about 65 BTUs per pound. And let's say we add, um, how many BTUs did I add? I added uh, 100 BTU, no, more than 100. They're in my notes. Sorry. Hold on a second here. <clears throat> I had to turn off my speaker notes for this to work right. Okay, I added 235 BTUs, okay? I just arbitrarily picked, let's say, I, I send that into an evaporator and I add 235. Why did I pick 235? Well, so it'd be a nice round number because 65 plus 235 equals exactly 300, right? So what that's done, what has that done to my one pound of ammonia that I'm tracking? Well, it's moved me to the right. I'm, I'm now adding heat to that pound of saturated liquid, which is causing it to become a vapor, right? Now, how much of a vapor did I become? Well, I'm somewhere between this 0.4 and 0.5. I just kind of guess. I'm just, I just kind of guess what, that it was like, uh, looks like about 0.42. So I'm 42% vapor by adding 235 BTUs. Okay, you see how that kind of works? Um, I'm just kind of playing around with this. Right now, we're not really diagramming the system yet, which we're going to do in a second. Now, if I go all the way to become a saturated vapor, that corresponds to 618 BTUs, okay? This difference, 618 minus 65, we could solve with the calculator, 553 BTUs. What is that? That is the latent heat of vaporization of the ammonia at 20 degrees. That is what the that is what that represents. So, the, you know, if you taking the Kiro exam, you probably had to memorize, right? The latent heat of vaporization of water, 970 BTUs per pound, right? That's like one of those things you have to have memorized. Latent heat of fusion, 144 BTUs per pound. But, with the, but that, what that fails to recognize is that that's at a specific condition. That's at sea level, 14.7 PSI um, A, zero gauge. Um, so, and actually, the latent heat of vaporization actually changes, not, not substantially, but certainly as you get to the top, it becomes much smaller as you're close to the top of the curve. So latent heat of vaporization is not just one number when you're talking about a refrigeration system. It changes based on what, what temperature and pressure you're at, okay? All right, um, let's look at the other lines, okay? This blue line, this is now tracing a constant temperature line. So then the constant temperature lines look a little funky. It's this stair-step thing. Right? We're basically vertical in the saturated liquid side or the uh, subcooled liquid area. Then we become perfectly horizontal through the saturation dome. And then we fall almost vertically again on the superheated. So what's the meaning of this? Well, I already mentioned the horizontal part. 
you guys already know this if you're familiar with refrigeration, which is that when we are boiling or when we are condensing, there's no change in temperature, right? You, you have a pot of water on the stove, you add heat to it, it starts bubbling, it's going to stay at 212 degrees. That's what's also happening in the evaporator. The ammonia liquid, as it changes the vapor, is not changing temperature. It's staying at constant temperature. That's what's represented there. But as soon as as soon as soon you become a saturated vapor, now you keep adding heat, so you keep moving this way, look what's going to happen. You're going to start increasing that temperature quite drastically. So what that teaches us is the uh, available heat transfer capacity in terms of sensible heat when you get out here is so much less because you're going to just start rapidly increasing the temperature right as you as you go because even if you just added like right now i'm at whatever that is 660 let's say and i you know i get out to here i'm already to a temperature of like 200 degrees i've gone from 20 to 200 by only moving that distance so it's very dramatic the power of refrigeration is in is in this uh saturation dome. That's why we keep going change the state back and forth, liquid vapor, vapor li liquid. All right. Okay. Um, another example you could, and this is, I kind of stole my own, my own thunder here. So we started with a, somewhere in the middle of our saturation dome. We add heat um, that takes us all the way out to uh, like, a, we started at 40 degrees and this would take us all the way out to like 180 degrees. Once we leave that saturation, though, we're going to start adding heat quickly. Or we're going to start adding, adding temperature quickly as we add heat. All right. A few other lines. I don't want to get too bogged down with these, but this line on the superheated side that, I've, that I'm tracking is a line of constant entropy. Entropy. What is it? Well, um, the third law of thermodynamics states that entropy always increases. Okay. So entropy, I don't want to get into it. It's got some funky units, but basically what you want to know for the the sake of like this class and the read a book is that when we are, uh, when we um, analyze a compression process, we assume it to be a constant entropy process. Like the fancy way to say that is isentropic. Okay, it's an isentropic process. It follows this line, theoretically. In real life, it doesn't, but that's that's what we say. There's all, whoops, I skipped one. Oh, maybe not. Oh, yeah, sorry, the green one. The green one up there, that's a line of, uh, constant um, density. So that's also out there. So we can, well, I don't use, I don't actually refer to those too much, but I wanted, I think I've gone over every single line now, actually, that's on this chart. So there's a lot of them. They show, they show the units periodically, but not all the time. So you just have to kind of find the units and then you can kind of track. They didn't show it on every single line because that would get so busy and it already is busy enough. Okay. Let's apply this to a real life system. All right and see how this could be practical, possibly for you. And then you can go tomorrow to work and do this on your system, right? And turn it into your boss and, or hang it on your refrigerator at home or whatever, okay? So we, we're gonna do a simple system. This will be a single stage system that has one evaporator, one compressor, one condenser, one expansion valve, simple as it gets. I know your systems are way more complicated than this, so it makes it more challenging. We are going to say this system has a 90 degree condensing temperature, a 30 degree evaporator temperature, and there's a three PSI pressure drop between the evaporator and the compressor, okay? This is very closely mimicking, by the way, the example that's in read a book two, chapter two. So if you looked at that and track, I'm doing like the same problem, all right? It turns out we're gonna be operating kind of between these two lines. Notice this is, um, I, I've made my line like a little below 20 degrees and near a hundred. So I'm gonna zoom in here just to make it so we can zoom in and see things better. That's all I did there, okay? Does that make sense? Because we don't, we're not really gonna be in this region or up there at all. So we're getting a magnified, magnified view of where our system will be. All right, where should we start? Well, let's start at point A. This is um, over at our saturated liquid line and we have a dot corresponding to 30 degrees that is on what, what side of our dome? There we go. Going into our evaporator. You guys comfortable with that? Okay. Now in our evaporator, we're going to add heat. What that theoretically, the system's designed well, that evaporator sized for the heat load that it'll be receiving and it'll cause that saturated liquid to become a vapor. Okay. And we'll call that point where it leaves point B. So point A was entering the evaporator. Point B is leaving the evaporator. 
Um, point C, I told you there was a three PSI pressure drop. Point C is corresponding to uh, the um, inlet to the compressor. Is the outlet of the evaporator the usually the exact same lo physical location as the inlet to the compressor? No. What's in between? Pipe. Sometimes, sometimes lots of pipe, sometimes less pipe. I mean, it all depends on the situation. It could be a lot, it could be a little different size pipe. So there's all variation here. But notice we drop down slightly. Why did we drop down? Well, I said a three PSI pressure drop. So that's three PSI lower than on our vertical axis. Make sense? So that's what we're doing there. Why did I move further this way? More heat got added. Is that a... Why would I add more heat? Not so much friction. Where's the pipe? Probably on the roof, right? Is more heat getting added to that pipe? Yeah, more heat's getting added. Now, it all depends on a lot of very a lot of things. The, the size of the pipe, the, the quality and thickness of the insulation on the pipe and stuff, right? So that could be more substantial if it's like a really long run or poorly insulated. It could also be really close to the same there if it's like a really large pipe. So there's hardly any pressure drop and it's really well insulated. So by looking at the outlet of your evaporator compared to the inlet to your compressor, you'll be able to see the difference between point B and point C. But either way, as you're going to see, the difference here does have quite an impact, as you'll see. Even that real, that looks very insignificant at this moment. You agree with that? Yeah, it looks, looks insignificant, but it actually, uh, it actually does uh does matter. Okay. So, and notice the temperature that's corresponding to, it looks like it's about at 40 degrees. So we're at 30 degrees, but the inlet, our compressor is going to be about 40 degrees. That's our, how many degrees of superheat? 10 degrees, 10 degrees of superheat. All right. Now we'll trace our isentropic line. We'll go up until we reach our condensing pressure, which I said was about 90 degrees. I said, no, I said it was 90 degrees, not about, it was 90 degrees. Okay. And that's point D. Now, what's our temperature? We're kind of right here. So we trace down this line. We're like around 200 degrees. Superheated, getting hotter. Now, in real life, will the temperature be higher or lower than that? It will be lower. Why? Yeah, because oil cooling. Yeah, oil, co oil and cooling of the compressor. So it'll actually be, be a little bit lower than that in real life. And now where do we now what do we do? We go into our, our condenser. First thing that happens is that vapor gets desuperheated. That's the first thing that happens in the condenser until we hit that. And then once we hit, so it's getting cooled. Every time it crosses one of these lines, cooled, cooled, cooled until we hit here. And now we'll be a constant temperature across our vapor dome until we become a saturated vapor again, which will be point E, right? Now, the, then we need one final step. What's our final step? How do we go from E back down to our green line? expansion valve we need expansion all right and so we assume that's assumed to be a constant enthalpy process so we're not going to move on here so we're gonna um we're gonna go straight down that's my yellow line that brings us to point f now notice our one pound of ammonia didn't end where our first where our pound started at point a so what's the deal with that so we did not end with a saturated liquid we're close to a liquid, like we're closer to a liquid than we are to a vapor. But what is the meaning of the fact that F is off the, the saturated liquid line? What is that? What is that telling us? Or why is that? What do we know about the, what's our penalty for expanding a liquid? Flash gas. So that is kind of visually showing you your flash gas. We would rather be at point A. But that's flash gas. Now, just you guys can already see this. And I'm stealing my own thunder because I have a slide coming up in a little bit. But um, if we were to lower our suction pressure, our suction temperature, let's say down to zero, would we have more or less flash gas? Can you tell? Because that yellow line would be constant. Would be would be further away from the saturated liquid line or closer to it? Would be further, which means more flash gas. So the greater our compression ratio, same would be true if we raised our discharge pressure, by the way, our condensing pressure. The, more, the, the greater the compression ratio, the more flash gas. The, the, more, the narrower the compression ratio, the, 
go by splash gas. Okay. So there's our cycle. We did a, we did a cycle. Uh, now, okay. Is my thing working? Okay. Now let's analyze this a little bit. All right. So we entered at point A, we were at 75 BTUs per pound. That was our specific enthalpy. And we exited at 622 BTUs per pound. So the latent heat of vaporization there was 547. Do you guys even remember what I said? It was at 20 degrees. It was like 553, right? Mm -hmm. I think. So notice again, latent heat of vaporization is not the same at every condition. It's close, but it's not the exact same. So that's our latent heat of vaporization. Now, what is what is the mean of this? I already told you. So that's 75 or 140 minus 75, which is 65, that's 65 BTUs per pound. That flash gas penalty is 65 BTUs per pound, which means our one pound of ammonia, we're gonna look at it this way, for every pound of ammonia in our system, we weren't able to utilize 65 BTU of capacity that could have theoretically been available because it evaporated as it went through the expansion valve. So therefore it did not evaporate inside the evaporator. Right. Okay. So our refrigerating effect or our refrigeration effect, which is a term used in the Rita book quite a bit, is actually the difference between these two, which is the 622 minus the 140, 482 BTUs per pound. Because that's what was actually used to cool something, not the full latent heat of vaporization. Okay. That's our refrigerating effect. Now, this was an additional three BTUs that was gained in our piping, in the suction piping. All right. So that seems kind of insignificant. However, it's not completely insignificant because I didn't put the line up here, but imagine we had we didn't have this little blue line here, like B and C were the same points. And then our compression would be like right here, right? It would be like just inside there. Notice we would have be at like 180, 180 degrees instead of 200 degrees. Would that be better or worse? Would you rather have a higher temperature or a lower temperature? Lower. Lower is always better, like in terms of wear and tear on the equipment, friction, oil breakdown, all sorts of things. So we'd always like it to be lower. So it, it does matter. Furthermore, that three BTUs, that's only three BTUs, but that three BTUs has to be rejected by the condenser over and over and over again for every pound of ammonia in the system. So it does just increase the amount of uh, condenser that you're going to need, even though it's not a, a substantial piece, it is a piece but not nearly as substantial as this next piece, which is what? So the difference between the 625 and the 700, what is that representing? What, what, there you go, heat of compression. So heat of compression can't be forgotten because st still it's not nearly as substantial as our refrigerating effect from there to there, but 75 BTUs is substantial. I think read a book one says heat of compression. You could like rule of thumb estimate it as 25% of your evaporator load. I think in this example, it's um, 16%, but still substantial. So the condenser, which has to go from D to E needs to be sized to reject the heat from the evaporator, any of the piping and the heat of compression. And this diagram helps to demonstrate that to you, hopefully. Okay. Well, that heat of compression, it doesn't go away. It, it, it's always there because whether you're using a water cool oil cooler or a thermal siphon or liquid injection, you're still cooling that and it's going through a condenser. That's right. One way or another. One way or another. Yep. So that is what the condenser needs to be sized for that 560 BTUs per pound. Okay. All right. Now, this is really the meat and potatoes. I want to be uh, cognizant of the time. Oh, we're good. It's 6.39. We're going to 9 p.m., right? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> In increase. Let's, let's look at how this chart can help us to uh, assess or analyze systems. So what happens now to our system as we, in this first case, we increase our condensing pressure? Okay, let's say this is the exact same chart we already made, and now we have to increase why would we have to increase it, by the way? There you go. Could be ambient conditions. All right. That could be a reason. You have to. All right. Got hot outside. Okay. Well, what happens here? Well, it needs to go up further. What's the consequence of that? 
Yes. Right? Look at look at the So we're going from there to there. You might be like, well, that doesn't seem like a big deal. No, it's kind of a big deal. That's 200 to 220. Again, it may not break anything. It might be fine. But over day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out, it's going to have its effects. Okay. And then look what it did over here at point F. See, it moved our point F because now we hit the saturated liquid line at a point further to the right of our chart. So what do we have more of? We have a little bit more flash gas and we have, therefore, you could also say we have less refrigeration effect because the distance between here and here is slightly less. And so is this a net positive or a net negative? Negative, we don't like this, this is bad, All right? That's no good, that's no good. All right, let's now decrease our evaporator pressure. We already, I already did, had told you to do this, but we just lowered it down to, uh, looks like 10 degrees roughly. Okay, well, what's that going to do? Okay, well, that you keeping this as a single stage system, right? I haven't gone to, we haven't looked at two stage yet. Well, that threw us way out here now. We're like past the 240, which is getting to be um, almost unacceptable, right? Um, this is where, which is leading to something. We're going to show a two, what a two stage system would look like. Um, and so, therefore, now too, we have more. We have more flash gas. So our temperature is way higher and our flash gas has increased again. So you could say by increasing compression ratio, compression ratio visual is, visually is the distance between the green line and the orange line. As that gets bigger, you're going to have more heat, more discharge temperature, higher discharge temperature, and you're going to have more flash gas every time. And the higher power bill. Yep, you will. Yep. <laughs> okay, now what happens with superheat at the condensed compressor inlet? Let's just say your evaporator load increase is a DX system. So it's not big enough. So you're evaporating all the liquid and now you're just adding heat to the vapor. So now you're increasing the temperature of the ammonia at the outlet of the evaporator. So that's showing like if this were to go out here at the outlet of the evaporator. And now our compressor will look like that. So what's that done? Well, it's increased our temperature quite substantially how I showed that, okay? Um, that's extra heat that needs to be rejected by the comp condenser and we've increased our discharge temperature. Okay, these are all negative so far. So let's do some good things. How this could do, look at this to do some good things. What's the benefit of subcooling? Because subcooling is kind of like a, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of hard to explain to people, honestly, like why you should consider subcooling. Like why, like, cause it's like, just like, whoa, I already have liquid, why do I need to cool it? Like how do you, I'm using my refrigeration system to cool my refrigeration system. It's kind of like this, parasitic load in a sense and it is in a sense but it can be beneficial and this helps to show why okay um let's look my own okay so what it would sub cooling look like what would it look like take going further to the left on our outlet of our condenser and maybe that's through adding a sub cooler or maybe it's just a way oversized condenser or something where you're actually at the outlet you're now you're now going beyond the saturated liquid line. So now what's going to happen? Where's our point F going to be? So what does that mean? Less of what? Less flash gas and more refrigeration effect, right? So that's now we've gained. So that's the benefit of flash gas. Now it did cost us something. Don't forget. Subcooling does cost you because you're using your ammonia system to support that liquid. So it's not free. Yeah, of course, the heat exchanger costs money as well. But this could be really beneficial, especially when you have long runs of liquid line where some of that, if it's a saturated liquid, is going to evaporate due to the heat from the ambient conditions. If you have 85 degrees condensing and you've got a 120 degrees on your roof, yeah, you've got quite a bit of heat load on that pipe right there. Yeah, but once you subcool it, you should insulate it. Don't subcool, don't subcool it and not insulate it. Yeah. Right? Why rye up? You want to keep it subcooled. So, all right, now decreasing the condenser pressure. Well, that's going from here to here. It's a reverse of what I've already shown you. So now our compression process is uh, is uh, end here. So we're at a lower temperature, right? Whoops, sorry. We're at a lower temperature. And we hit the, the vapor dome further on the left, which means less flash gas. So that's a benefit. And then I think this might be the final one, increasing evaporator pressure. I think you guys get it by now. You, you, you raise that one. 
and now you're going to have a lower discharge temperature and less flash gas. Now, the two-stage system, this obviously gets way more complicated. Flooded systems get complicated. I'm not even going to show you a flooded system right now. Um, well, I'll show you. I'll just say, I'll say something about flooded systems. Let me say one thing about flooded systems, but I didn't make a thing for it. But basically, in a flooded system, what do we do? We get to this point F. Where does point F in a flooded system? It's not the inlet the evaporator. Where is it? It's in your surge drum or your accumulator, whatever you want to call it, right? So then, then from the the vapor part of that mixture goes directly back to the compressors or the recirculator, the suction or the suction accumulator, whatever. And you only send the liquid part to the evaporator. So you end up getting the pure liquid to the evaporator again. Okay. So you're not sending vapor through your evaporator, which is just wasting space inside those tubes. All right. You guys can think about that. All right, two-stage system. So why is a two-stage system good? Well, the best way to understand this, let's say we want to cool something really cold, minus 40. I kept everything the same, except now we're like a minus 40 blast freezer. We got to chill some stuff. We got to chill it quick and cold, All right? Well, that now looks like this. If we're going, to, if we're going single stage, right? So looks fine. Looks about the same, just bigger, except we got some massive problems here. Because look where, well, our flash gas is bigger. That's not a massive problem, but it is, it's not good. But what's our massive problem? Our massive problem is, well, in this, I'm going to come back to this in a second. But this is our massive problem. What would our theoretical discharge temperature be? We're at like 360 degrees. That is not okay. That's too hot. Like we can't, our equipment can't handle that. So that's a problem. But I've also showed this one. I haven't really pointed out this green line yet, this line of, of constant uh, density. <laughs> But our density, our density at a low temperature has decreased dramatically. In other words, our volume has increased dramatically. So the volume that the ammonia needs to occupy at these low temperatures is much greater, which means the pounds of ammonia passing through our compressor in this new conditions is much less, which is a, which is a problem. It's, a de it's gonna be a decrease in performance, okay? Uh, but this is a, this is a, game over situation. We can't even do this. Like we got to come up with a new solution. And that new solution is a two-stage system. That's why when you have a minus so this situation, you go to two stage. So what does that look like? Well, I'm not going to take the time to go through every single step, but basically we add the intercooler, we add the booster compressor. Sorry, but I can't go through every detail here. Let's just jump into the cycle. What's the intercooler doing? Well, it's de-superheating the booster discharge gas and then supplying liquid to our evaporator. In this case, we only have the low temp evaporator. We don't have any like high temp evaporators in this case. Okay. I'm just going to go through this. All right. What everything does. Let's not worry about that. So this makes it look like this. So our low stage compresses it to the intermediate. This is now inside the intercooler, the booster discharge gas getting desuperheated off the top of the intercooler. That goes to our high stage. So it takes this route. We've taken out this whole upper right corner. All that excess heat, all of that extra BTUs are gone. You guys seen that so far? This from there to there still represents our condenser. Let's say an EVAP condenser typically in our ammonia system on the roof. From E1 to F1 is the expansion valve that's supplying liquid to the um, intercooler because that's going to keep a pool of liquid. The vapor that forms as that flashes goes right back to the high stage compressors or compressor. The liquid E2 gets expanded again to our recirculator. So instead of going from here all the way to here, we are now much closer. So the liquid we get in our low temp evaporator is going to be much more, uh, much higher performing. Right. Just tracking with that. So what, what benefits have we uh, made? Well, let's just look here, basically, and this will be kind of the final thing. What is my screen doing right now? All right, oh, there we go. I kind of talked through everything already. All right, so we have lowered our discharge temperatures dramatically. I already said that. So rather than being way out here, we show we have very reasonable discharge temperatures, both on the booster and the high stage. So that's good. Um, already mentioned what this is doing. All right. 
So this is now the two, the single stage and the two stage overlaid on top of one another. So we can see like by getting rid of this, we have saved a bunch of money on an ongoing cost because we don't have all that extra horsepower to compress it from minus 40 all the way up. We've broken it into manageable stages. And more importantly, we've taken away that crazy discharge heat, um, which would just, yeah, wouldn't be, wouldn't be workable. And then additionally, we have um, gotten, we basically um, obtained, we've utilized this orange region that was formerly not, oops, sorry, that was formerly not in use. So that is like added refrigeration effect that we need to use in our late tenant pre operator. Okay. So, um, so that is the bird's eye view of the Moliere diagram. We've got um, 13 people online. Yeah, I've got a good crew, a good crew online. Thank you guys that are online for joining. Um, are there any questions? Now that's probably not good if there's no questions. Uh, but um, so how could you use this at your plant? I'll tell you, I'll give you an idea of how it, I think it could be used. Is it realistic that you're gonna spend some like every day drawing your out your system? No, I don't think that's realistic. However, if you picked a day and you picked an evaporator and a compressor, like you could get part of your system. And you were to, let's say, write down the ambient conditions of that day and document what were the conditions at the inlet of the compressor. What was it like those same points A through F? And then you were kind of like to save that Moliere chart, that pH diagram. And then you were to come back a year later and do it again. Similar conditions, hopefully, like a similar weather, similar loads, because all those things will play effect. That could be potentially interesting. Because if you're seeing a deviation that could maybe spell some trouble, something that requires some troubleshooting, right? Maybe something going on. And it could be a number of things depending on what, on what you're seeing, okay? Um, let's say your condensing pressure was a lot higher. Well, what might be causing that? Non-condensables, yeah, could be fouling on the condenser, scale buildup, bad, well, bad water. There's a lot of things, right? So you could use it as like in a snapshot in time, and then compare and contrast. At least that's how Rita Book Two um, is promoting the use of the Moliere diagram. And if nothing else, I, hopefully, if you can picture, kind of like freeze in your mind's eye some of this stuff. I know for me, it's been helpful, meaning like, oh, I kind of see now as I increase my condensing pressure and decrease my evaporator, I just know I'm going to get more flash gas. Why do I know? Well, because I could picture it from the Moyer diagram. Um, or as I, you know, you, you choose to undersize that suction pipe, or let's say you keep adding on and you don't increase the size of your suction main, you're going to end up getting more pressure drop. It's going to bring you like this blue lines extending. Well, that's going to cost me in discharge temperature and extra BTUs that have to be rejected. Like there are consequences of this stuff. This happens when systems get added to, right? Um, maybe they were properly designed at the front end, but then they get added to or they get repurposed for new commodity, new, new whatever, and then they're no longer quite as good. So, um, for those who are going to be taking the serial test, you might want to get familiar with this because there is a few test questions on there. Yeah, it's been a long time since I took it. I don't remember it being like a heavy emphasis. My recollection of the Ciro was like a bunch of compressor microprocessors, like abnormal, normal conditions and stuff. Um, certainly won't hurt to be familiar with it. Again, it will increase your understanding of refrigeration if even a little bit of these principles kind of stick. Like you, you, need, you need to understand this to understand what's going on with some of those. Um, yeah, it, it will help. It's kind of like, look, I tell people, I tell like in, engineers this, like, do I use Moliere charts a lot? No, I really don't. I'm not, I don't chart things, but it's kind of like a carpenter, like they're framing a house and they, what do they use? What's their 
tool to like put together all the uh, the framing, the nail gun, right? But every once in a while, what do they got to get out? Like it's a tough situation. They got to get out the hammer. Do they use a hammer all day, every day? Probably not. The carpenter uses a nail gun. But you just never know. Every once in a while, you get in that situation and you still got to know how to use the hammer. Right? So that's, and you guys know that's true of your job too. Like um, you're using drills all the time, but you got to be able to get the hand tools out um, as well. So, um, hey, we're just wrapping up here. Oh, I got a question. Sweet. On, on the from Don Anderson. All right, Don, you should have come in person. Uh, <laughs> all right, how do these engineers use this chart for condensers in cold weather compared to the sense in cold weather? Oh, so his question was, how do engineers use this chart for condensers in cold weather states? Um, they would use it the exact same way. I wouldn't be. It wouldn't be tremendously different. Um, hot weather, cold weather. You could use the same chart. Same same thing would apply. So there wouldn't be uh, so much a hot weather, cold weather differentiation. All right, then some other time. Uh, all right, someone's leaving some help. Looks like they've taken the zero that said there was only a few questions, like uh, maybe five out of a hundred. So not the, so if this is just still totally intimidating, don't, you know, you don't have to panic. Um, so for those that are, um, for those that are uh, on the, chat you many of you have left your name but not your email addresses so i'm gonna screenshot this right now so hopefully hopefully the board has your um hopefully the board has it and um otherwise well otherwise you're not gonna get a certificate yeah, there we go. So again, and if you uh, if your name Matt is on this, you could also email me. I guess if you have my email address and um, and send me your email address, we get the certificate. But we definitely have the list of names. All right. Any other questions? The starting point of your name is all the way in the left of your your domain. You're never actually starting there. Okay. So in a DX evaporator no you wouldn't be but in a flooded you, or a recirc you would because you expand down to that point f and basically at that point our, our one pound of ammonia gets divided and the vapor goes right back to the compressor the the pure liquid the pure liquid goes um, to the evaporator so you are getting pure liquid but the DX system, which is the easiest to bit, that's why it gets more complicated. Like it's harder to chart because your pound of ammonia gets divided in things like surge drums, accumulators, or circulators. Um, it looks the same, the same exact thing as going into a surge drum. That part's exactly the same. But then you have the added what? The pump, the pumps. So what are the pumps doing? Well. The pumps are increasing. I'll just here. Let me um, make this bigger. The pumps. Are, uh, we can do it on here, but the pumps are increasing. So we're out. We're out here, right? With our with our liquid, and then what's the pump going to do? What does the pump do? Every yeah, it increases pressure. Right. Keep it simple. Increases pressure without substantially changing the enthalpy. I'm not going to say it doesn't change the enthalpy. So what would that look like? Brandon, calling on Brandon. If you're increasing pressure and not enthalpy, where are you going from? Let's say you're starting at just that yellow point. No. We're going to go vertical. Right? Because we're going to increase pressure without changing this substantially. So we're going to, our liquid's going to become what? Subcool. That does happen on your circulators. It makes it sub cool. What do you think? Now, <laughs> you believe that the pumps add pressure, right? We're good with that. Like, we're good with that fact. Let's keep the fact. Pumps add pressure. Just believe me, they're not substantially changing the enthalpy. That one, I'll just say, hey, just trust me on that one. It's not substantially. So we're moving upward. Now we're like, well, wait a minute. But 
we're going to end up in our evaporator back at a cold temperature because how much pressure is the pump adding? It's just adding the pressure needed to get into the evaporator. So that is different. So that's actually now when it enters the evaporator, it's coming back down because the piping is, is losing. There's a lot of friction in that piping. Okay. <laughs> No, 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 not really. Because look, our not really. Look, here, hold on. Let me go to my constant temperature line. It's coming up, I think. There we go. There's our constant temperature line. Now that's way up at 90 degrees, but you know, let's say we're at 20 degree recirculator. All right, hold on. We're at 20 degree recirculator. Okay, the pump's gonna like send it up here. Look, that that constant temperature line is almost vertical outside there. See that? It's pre pretty much vertical. Not perfectly, but pretty much. Yeah, that's a more advanced question. It's okay to just wrestle with that one a little. Wrestle, wrestle with that a little bit. But, but basically, you're going to be going from the saturated liquid up, basically a constant temperature, basically a constant enthalpy, increasing pressure, right? And that would be the outlet of the pump. Then the inlet of the evaporator is going to be moving roughly back down to the same point you started because that's what the pump is doing. The pump, the pump is just providing the pressure to move the liquid to where you want it. So, so you're just got this little movement up and back down. Now, this, is, this is going on a little rabbit trail here, but at the inlet of a pump, you've got to make sure that you're not at the point of saturation. You've got to be subcooled. So your accumulator is designed to have so much, some, so much head pressure instead of head above that pump. So the temperature of the, the liquid at the top of the vessel is saturated, but at the bottom of the vessel it's subcooled. So when you draw into that pump, you got to make sure that the suction on that pump doesn't drop the pressure enough to cause it to Ammonia to flash. Otherwise, you get a cavity. So that's why it's important to have that that liquid head stack on top of your pump to know what the static head pressure is on your pump and your system. Yeah. So that you don't get in that situation and tear your pumps up. We got another question from Jesse. Jesse's the president, right? All right. Question from the president. Mm -hmm. How do you use the Moliere diagram for a cascade system? It's a good question. So you have if you have a cascade system that's Ammonia CO2 is probably what he's talking about. Basically, you would do, it's two separate systems. A cascade system is just two systems. And so you would do it two times. But you got to make sure you use the right chart because you use the ammonia for one. And you'd want to get the, the CO2 Moliere diagram. By the way, all the Moliere diagrams like basically look the same. Like they all have a dome. Some domes are skinnier. Obviously, the numbers are different, the pressures and everything. But they all have a similar look, which means the principles could be applied to any refrigerant. But in the ASHRAE book, you have the Moliere diagram for like every single refrigerant, all the Freons, everything. Okay. Even 718? Yes. Mm -hmm. Even 718. Mm -hmm. Just water. Mm -hmm. 744 CO2. 717. Is that one? Ammonia. Okay. All right. All right. Well. I guess that's it. Special thanks to the, I, I was wondering if anyone would join the live stream. So I'm happy with 13. Not quite viral yet, but I don't think we're getting, I don't think, I don't think we're getting monetized. <laughs> but at least someone's out there. Yeah. Yeah. But all of you guys should have been here in person. No excuses. All right. Now everyone's going to be on live stream next time all right thank you all for joining i'm ending the ending the stream <clears throat> all right